Welcome to Electra Online. Now let's take a look at the physical characteristics or properties of the four Galilean moons and let's compare it to the moon, our own moon, and in some cases also to the Earth. So, first of all, the radius. So notice the moon's radius is 1737 kilometers. And if we compare that to the four Galilean moon, it's very similar. 1822, 1561, 2634, and 2410. Now notice that both Callisto and Ganymede are considerably larger than the moon. That number inside the parentheses indicate relative to the moon. The moon being one, notice that Ganymede has about a 50% greater radius than the moon. When it comes to Europa and Io, they're very similar in size. Europa is slightly smaller than the moon and Io is slightly larger than the moon. So how big are they as far as surface area is concerned? Well, the moon is about 38 million square kilometers, which is 7.4% the surface area of the Earth. So now we're going to compare it to the Earth. For Io, it's 8.2% of the Earth, 42 million square kilometers, 31 million square kilometers for Europa, which is 6.1%, 87 million square kilometers, which is 17% of the surface of the Earth, which is it's the largest moon in the solar system, and then Callisto is not far behind at 73 million square kilometers. Now notice those numbers, millions of square kilometers for surface area. So when we begin to explore these moons, there's a lot of surface area to be explored. There's a lot to it. So it's not an easy task to do so. So simply landing one single satellite on the surface of the moon somewhere or on one of the Galilean moons only gives you information about that particular region. And there could be other regions that have very different characteristics. So it's quite a task to learn a lot about all these moons. They're simply very large. As far as the volume is concerned, notice we're talking about giga cubic kilometers, so a billion cubic kilometers, 22, 25, 16, 77, and 59. So relatively speaking, about one and a half to 7% the volume of the Earth, 7% for Ganymede and 1.5% for Europa. If we then look at the mass, notice if the moon's mass is about 7.3 times 10 to the 22nd kilograms, which is 1.23% the mass of the Earth, that means you need about 80 moons to be equivalent to the mass of the Earth. Notice that Io is a little bit uh, more massive at 8.93 times 10 to the 22 kilograms, so you might need about 75 Earths. I didn't put the percentage down here. Uh, 4.8 times 10 to the 22nd, so less than 1% the mass of the Earth, you need more than 100 Europas to come up with an equivalent mass for the Earth. Ganymede is 2.5% the mass of the Earth, so that means you need 40 Ganymedes to make up one Earth, and you need a little over 50 Callistos to make up one Earth. Density-wise, notice that is a very important quantity here. The Moon has a density of 3.34 grams per cubic centimeter, which means that the average density of the Moon is greater than the average density of rock. Now, we think the Moon is primarily made out of rock, that is correct. But because it's 3.34 grams per cubic centimeter, we expect that there's a small iron core at the center of the moon. Now, when you look at Io, you can come to the same conclusion. The fact that the density of Io is even greater than the density of the moon. Matter of fact, Io has the greatest density of any moon in the solar system. We can imagine that there's a considerable core of iron at the center of the moon. Europa also being 3.01 grams per, cu per cubic centimeter, even though it's less than our own moon, that is still greater than the typical density for rock. And we also know that Io contains a fair amount of ice and potentially also some liquid water underneath that ice, which has a density of about one. So therefore you can see that again, I, uh, Europa is expected to have some sort of metallic core to make up that great average density. Now when we come to Ganymede and Callisto, notice their densities. They are considerably less than the typical density for rock. Density for rock is about 2.6. So when we look at less than 2, that means that those two moons have a considerable amount of ice, ice water or ice from water, locked in the moon. 
and so we expect to see a lot of ice within those moons. Now that's kind of typical for structures far away into the solar system. There's a lot of ice in the far reaches of the solar system, especially when we deal with the comets coming from the Oort cloud and the Copper Belt. So it's not unusual to see that in these moons, but notice it is quite different from the two inner moons, the two inner Galilean moons. The average surface gravity is all roughly about the same. This is 16.5% the gravitational force on the Earth, 18.3%, so notice Io with a greater density, slightly bigger moon. We see that the uh, gravitational force is a little bit bigger. 13.4% for Europa, which is less than our moon, 14.6% for Ganymede, and 12.6% for um, Callisto. Now notice, even though it's a very large moon with a much greater mass, since the density is so much lower, the gravitational force on the surface is actually weaker, so it would be easier to lift off from the moon. However, since it's bigger, it has a larger escape velocity. So even though it's easier to get away from the surface, it is not as easy to get away from the moon itself because the escape speed to get away from the uh, Ganymede needs to be 2.74 kilometers per second. When we compare that to the moon, it's 2.38. For Io, it's 2.56. It's a little bit over 2 for Europa, and it's 2.44 for Callisto. So you need to, if you were to land a spacecraft on one of those moons or on all four moons, to get away from those moons, you need to go the fastest to get, try to get away, from, get away from Ganymede simply because it's a larger moon with a larger mass. The equatorial velocity, it's kind of interesting because the orbits are, of course, locked in synchronization. Uh, the rotational speed or the rotation of the moons is locked in with the orbital uh, motion of the moons. And so notice that at the equator, the speed is 38 kilometers per hour for Callisto, 96 km kilometers per hour for Ganymede, 115 kilometers per hour for Europa, and 271 kilometers per hour for Io. That's quite fast. So when you're on the equator of Io, you're moving quite fast because the orbital, uh, the uh, orbital speed is large, and or the orbital period is small, and therefore the rotational speed must be very large. Compared that to the Moon, it's only 17 kilometers per hour. The Moon rotates very, very slowly. Then albedos, another interesting uh, set of numbers. Notice that the albedo of Europa is 0.67, that's because it's primarily covered with ice, and so you expect albedo to be quite high. But what was surprising is that also Io has a very high albedo, because it has very young surface, a lot of volcanic activity, a lot of new covering of those surfaces. There's certain ices on top of the surface, so you can see that Io is also a very bright moon. Now compare that to our own moon, our own moon is extremely dark relative to those two moons, so it doesn't reflect a lot of the sunlight. Now when we take a look at Ganymede, it's also relatively bright compared to our moon, but not nearly as bright as Europa and Io. And then here Callisto, notice Callisto is a fairly dark moon, it has a very low albedo, but what's surprising to me is that the albedo of the moon is actually less than the albedo of Callisto. I wouldn't expect that but I suppose the rigolite on top of the moon does not reflect light very well, maybe scatters light very well, but doesn't reflect light very well, so we don't, it doesn't appear very bright uh, towards us. Temperature on the surface, notice of course, depends on day and night. It varies from 80K during the nighttime to 165K in the daytime for Callisto. Notice that the numbers are relatively the same for Ganymede, a little bit colder at night and a little bit colder at the daytime. Well, the reason for that could be that it's a, a brighter moon. A brighter moon reflects more light, so it tends not to heat up as much on the surface. Notice Europa is a very bright moon, so notice the nighttime temperature is 50K, daytime temperature 125K, which is significantly cooler than both Callisto and Ganymede, but that is because it's a very reflective moon, so we expect the temperatures to be a little lower. And then what's surprising is we would expect about the same thing for Io, but notice that the nighttime temperature is 90K and the daytime temperature is 130K, a little bit warmer than, um, than Europa, but that's because there's a lot of interaction between Io and the particles that are in that region of its orbit. There's a lot of collisions there, and so there's a lot of energy created by those collisions, by the magnetic fields, and by the interaction, and so therefore the temperatures on the surface appear to be a little higher.
Compared to the moon, of course, it's quite different. In the daytime, it's blazing hot at 390K. In the nighttime, it dips down to minus 100K. The night times, of course, on the moon are very large. Let's see. Let's, uh... Well, that's right. Daytime temperature on the moon, uh, the, the daytime lasts about two weeks, and the nighttime lasts about two weeks. So after two weeks of cooling down, the temperatures get to be quite low on the moon. Then we have a couple more things. Atmospheric pressure. There is not really much of an atmosphere on any of the moons, especially on our moon. Notice from 10 to the minus 7 to 10 to the minus 9 pascals, so it's a very, very low pressure. Uh, we do find mercury, argon, neon, sodium, potassium, hydrogen, and radon gas near the surface of the moon, but in such small quantities you really cannot call it an atmosphere. Uh, what we do see is uh, on Callisto, the atmospheric pressure averages about 75 micropascals. That's quite a bit more than on our moon. Ganymede varies from 0.2 to 1.2 micropascals, so that's even larger than uh, that we see in Callisto. Europa has a very uh, a much smaller atmospheric pressure. Again, these are very, very tiny numbers, so don't think of it as really an atmosphere. However, when we get to Io, it's quite different. Io has some measurable atmosphere at 0.5 to 4 millipascals. Notice these are micropascals, these are millipascals, so we're talking about over a thousand times the atmospheric pressure on Io relative to Callisto, Ganymede, and Europa. And so therefore there is something to it. The primary cause of that is the volcanic eruption, so a lot of odd gassing, and the moon is large enough to partially hang on to that atmosphere for a little bit before it leaks off. And most of that then is made up of sulfur dioxide, about 90% of it. We'll talk about that a little bit more because that's kind of interesting relative to Io. When you add it all up, if you were to take all the atmosphere as Io, you'd have quite a bit of atmosphere. So that gives you a fairly good idea about the main parameters of the moons compared to our moon. On the next video, we're going to talk about the the uh, synchronization of the orbits of the moon that's really really interesting there as well and then of course we'll go and talk about some of the details of each of the moons um, the moons are quite fascinating each moon is so different from each other moon the four moons of jupiter are extremely different from one another very very interesting some really interesting uh, concepts and things that we discovered there so if you're interested in it we'll have some videos talking about the details of those as well coming up